usually when I'm doing readings, it's it's because I'm I'm promoting a book or something boring like that. Um, and it was such a pleasure tonight to um, to kind of step back and let myself think, what do I really want to read? What do I really want to talk about tonight? Because um, I'm sort of in between book projects right now. So um, I remembered that uh, recently I have had the somewhat unpleasant experience of reading back through a lot of um, blog entries, which is not something that y any of you who have blogs, you, you know you should not do that unless you want to day drink. Um, <laughs> because it's really brutal reading back through things that you did years and years ago that are public and out there and everybody can still see how terrible they were. Um, but anyway, as I was going through these blog posts, uh, you know, most of the time I was dying a little bit, but some of the time I, I, I was really like pleasantly surprised and um, and yeah that feeling was really really incredible and so what I what I decided I wanted to do tonight is read a, a couple um, blog posts actually things that I've never actually read aloud um, other than to myself in the privacy of my home um, anyway and one of them the first one I'm gonna read is uh, it's about um, well, I won't tell you what it's about, but it is, um, it's a blog post that I wrote in October of 2010, so about four years ago. And, and the theme of, of both of these, the reason I put them together, is they're both about gladness. They're both about um, a, a feeling of, hi, Judy. Um, they're both about um, feeling glad. So uh, this first one is called Now Here, Now There. Can everybody hear me OK? OK. I have two half-brothers who live on the East Coast, and when I was a kid, if they came home for the holidays, they would bring a styrofoam cooler of oysters. My father would get out his knife and his shucking glove and lean against the kitchen counter, flicking grit and shells into the sink as he went, and they would all stand around eating and sighing, making the kind of noises that people make when they eat oysters. I don't know how old I was that night, but I think I must have been about six. I stood next to my father while he shucked, and he leaned down and gave me an oyster, a fat one, an enormous one, amoeba-like, dripping with brine. I have no memory of eating it. I must have forgotten on purpose. <laughs> but I do know that I ate it, approximately, if nearly choking can be considered eating. And then it took me 25 years to eat another. 25 years, 25 years. When I get freaked out about something, I get freaked out, like quarter of a century long freak out, freaked out. The look of an oyster, the texture, the choking thing, I was all right with the idea of never eating a second. But around this time last year, we had a cook at Delancey who wanted to play around with oysters. And so Brandon went to the Sunday market and bought some Kumamoto's from Taylor Shellfish. At lunch that day, this cook made a mignonette, and then he shucked three oysters and put them on a plate, and then he dared me. <laughs> I wanted to punch him in the face. I was not pleased. I did what I do when I am presented with something that scares the crap out of me. I picked up an oyster, stared at it, and thought I was going to cry. I made everyone look away, and then I ate it. Only one, and it was tiny, but I ate it. I chewed and everything. I didn't die. And when I swallowed, the flavor rang around my mouth the way the ringing of a bell ricochets inside a cathedral. Now here, now there. And it did that for maybe 10 seconds. Now here, now there, before it dissipated. It tasted like seawater and melon and wet rocks. I didn't even hate it. I almost liked it. I'm not going to tell you that I'm a reformed person or that I pop oysters like jelly beans. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Last spring, the first time I was faced with a dozen oysters, a whole dozen to myself, I felt like ducking under the table and making a run for it. I was forced to resort to something like woman in labor breathing techniques, a full body, ah, to get me from oyster to oyster. Sometimes I still do, but it's getting easier. And it's worth it to me because there's no other flavor like it anywhere. I'm glad I learned that and that I let myself learn it. A couple of weeks ago, when we had friends in town, I took them to our neighborhood oyster bar, a place called the Walrus and the Carpenter. 
We ate oysters from the Effingham Inlet on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Ben had never had them before, and when he tasted his first, he yelled, oh my god! And I'm almost certain, almost, that he would have done that even if he hadn't been drinking a cocktail called the Mustache Ride. <laughs> it was that kind of oyster. I met a man on a plane once, and we got talking about food. This guy had a Texas accent and the stature of a former football player, but his mother was a tiny Italian woman, he told me, holding his hands about a foot apart to show me how tall she was. We talked about Seattle restaurants, about where he took his wife for their wedding anniversary, about our dogs, about his kids. He has a son in his early 20s, and his son is away at college. But sometimes when they're together, he told me, they go out for oysters. They'll suck down four or five dozen, he said, grinning. And they'll drink some beers, just the two of them. And a couple of hours will go by, and it's just great, he said. And then he grinned even wider, thinking about it. And he sort of hopped around in his seat. And his face got pink, and he started to giggle. This guy giggled. I get it now, and I'm glad for that. OK. Hey, everybody. Um, I want to read to you tonight, actually similar to Molly, one of, I've just um, gotten off a tour, I'm in the middle of a tour, taking a breath on a tour, and I, for this book that just came out, which has been super fun, um, but I really, 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 really want to read something else tonight to you guys, because you're a special audience who would be into that. So I think what I want to do is read a piece that I'm thinking about as kind of a seed for another project, um, and it's called, I'm going to read the first half this time and the second half next time. And it's called um, The Poet's Guide to Huckleberry Picking. Can you hear me okay? Uh, no, Get a little closer. Yeah, yeah, okay, don't touch it. Oh, no, that doesn't, it doesn't amplify. It doesn't amplify? It's for recording. It's for recording. Yeah. This isn't a microphone. It's a microphone, but only for recording. Oh? Yeah. Yeah, oh. So you need to it's a fake yeah. microphone. <laughs> Except they'll go online. They'll still go online. So you're telling me I need to talk louder? Yes. Great. Okay, great. Hi. <laughs> you guys good? Okay, great. This is called The Poet's Guide to Huckleberry Picking. In the stories we were told as girls, squirrels and birds betrayed the maiden's approach through the forest. When a prince, beast, or crone blocked the path, she married them or mothered them or made herself an offering. Sorcery, sometimes love, could transform her into a new animal. Usually, through it all, she sang. I learned to hear her voice as a kind of map, not the sort you read, the sort that calls a guide toward you so you never have to learn where you're going. Kate and I will ride into Mount St. Helens at half horsepower, my little blue Camry chugging through the trees. Neither of us can sing. This is not a requirement of huckleberry picking. The ranger station finds us easily, just a white building on a paved road. A woman with nails the color of the berries we're looking for tells us she's all out of English maps, but she has these Russian ones. A lot of pickers out today, she says. On every flat surface, postcards and posters of the volcano, the blast. Stay out of the sawtooth fields, she says, pointing at a shade gray blob with her purple nail. During the Depression, hungry people from the lowlands stripped these bushes of berries, which, understandably, pissed off the Yakima, who had picked them for centuries. A 1932 handshake between Chief Yallop and the Gifford Pinchot National Forest Supervisor, J.R. Bruckhart, reserved the fields for the Yakima Nation ever after. The rest of the fields are for everyone, in any language, first come, first serve. Pick until you're bruised, burned, bloody, or bored up to three gallons of berries a year. We take Cyrillic maps in exchange for a promise to stay in our territory and drive triumphantly away. Northwest ladies doing Northwest things, Kate says. When Kate and I go out in the city and strangers ask who we are, I tell them we have the same name. Let them guess what it is. Nicole, Megan, we look a bit alike too. Pale skin, blue eyes, brown hair, both raised Catholic, both writers. How'd you get so good looking? A drunkard once asked us as he steadied himself at our table. It's my mama's fault, I said, to make him harmless. No kidding, I thought it was your daddy's, 
Then, you two sisters? Actual drool flapped out of his mouth and smacked the table. Sisters, I said, staring at the spit. Close enough, Kate said. We howled with laughter until the man wandered deeper into the bar. At the turnoff to Route 25, a white minivan is stalled on the side of the road. We stop. A man approaches Kate's roll down window. Where's the nearest gas station, he asks. 30 miles. A sign just past the ranger station told us so. You have help coming, we ask. We have no cell phone service. We have help coming, he says, we think. He's mumbling. OK, we say, and leave. What kind of idiot drives through Mount St. Helens without a full tank of gas, Kate says. I glance at my gas gauge. <laughs> I keep my mouth shut. We're not sure what a forest service road looks like, so we pick a path through the woods that's about car wide and not too overgrown. <laughs> Lord knows how we're going to turn around. What if bears, I think? A few tiny Douglas firs basking in a sunbreak are the most promising space we've seen so far, so I hook a quick left and mow them down with my bumper. My parents call trees like these volunteers and let me cut one from their backyard every Christmas. When I slam the door, the top of one gets caught in the car's frame. Kate inspects the brush for a natural root in. She looks slim, athletic, with a rosy northwest tan. Her backpack sits capably on her shoulders. The grocery sack looped around my wrist looks like the garbage it is. There's one. Kate points to a knee-high bush about 10 feet off the road, mostly leaves and branches. But look a little closer. Berries. Behind it, another bush. Behind that one, a cluster of them. I drop my sack by the car and, Tupperware in hand, follow Kate into the woods. Stop there. Okay, this second piece that I'm going to read is um, I wrote it this fall. It's called September 6th. From the summer of 2006 until the early spring of 2011, we lived in a nondescript duplex on 8th Avenue that shared the block with some other nondescript duplexes and one notably terrifying exception that we referred to as Boo Radley's house. I didn't love the neighborhood, but it was mostly fine. And after we adopted Jack, I got to know it well because Jack, being a terrier, needed a lot of walking. We found our habits. If the sun was out, we'd walk up to the pea patch at 60th and 3rd and ogle people's tomatoes and dahlias. If it was raining, I'd drag him for a quick loop around the block. And if it was dark, excuse me, and if it was evening, dark already but not too cold, we'd walk a big rectangle through East Ballard so that I could look through the lit up windows of the bungalows as we passed as families cooked and sat down to dinner. I often dreaded walking the dog, especially in the fall and winter when it gets dark so early, but once we were out and in a rhythm, the glowing squares of those windows would keep me going. We'll turn for home after we pass the next house, or, or wait, maybe the next one. And so would the smells that filtered out to the street. I remember one night when I caught what was surely the scent of banana bread baking, and another when someone was clearly burning garlic, and another when a whole block of 7th Avenue smelled like ripe apples. Or maybe it was applesauce cooking. Maybe I passed under an apple tree. It was too dark to tell. We live closer to the water now, about a, about a quarter mile from Puget Sound. And if the air smells like anything, it smells like salt water. I imagine that will always feel novel to me, having grown up in a city where the nearest beach was, I don't know, 500 miles away. <laughs> I don't walk much after dark now because Brandon is working and June is asleep in her crib and Jack is an old man. I'm usually doing something like I'm doing tonight, sitting on the sofa with Alice, avoiding the dirty laundry by drinking a Negroni and reading, listening to Jack snore down the hall. But this afternoon, June and I took a sunny bike ride around the neighborhood and somewhere between an impromptu stop at Uncle Sam's house and a quick trip to the grocery store, June started screeching that she couldn't get into her Tupperware of crackers. So I pulled over, reached into the bike trailer to help her, and that's when I noticed it. The air smelled like summer in Colorado, like the camp I went to for two summers 25 years ago, 
like dry pine needles in the heat. It's something we almost never smell here, living as we do in what is essentially a rainforest, where everything is damp and green, 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 always. But there it was. My memory of the scent was immediate, below language, just boom, Colorado, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. A couple of blocks later, blissed out in the grocery store parking lot, I misjudged a turn and fell off my bike into a trash can. <laughs> True story. Uh, but that smell, that smell, I'm glad I found it again. Here's the rest of the story. When I was 10, my fourth grade teacher taught us how to identify poisonous berries. White and green will kill you, he said. Blue and purple are edible. Red and orange, who knows? Take a chance. <laughs> he told us we could remember how to spell the word together by remembering to get her, giving the word a castle and princess, a sword to hack through briar. He looked like a beaver. His name sounded like milk. The first time I stuck my chest out while walking past a boy happened in that classroom, strutting through our rows of low desks with scissors and paper in my hands, head held, held high, flat bosom thrust up, vertebrae consenting to what would become a habitual arch. You always did want to look taller, my mother recently said. <laughs> the hinge in my spine is getting stiff. Lately, my back aches. Huckleberries are tight, blue-black orbs about half the size of a cultivated blueberry. Standing right next to a bush, they can be difficult to see. We bend down, lean on one knee like we're talking tenderly to children, and the lateral spray of leaves shifts with our perspective to reveal a small feast. The bushes grow in corridors of sunlight opened by falling trees, which are now the nurse logs we climb over to get to the next bush. Where there's better light, there's bigger fruit. Huckleberries have resisted our best efforts at domestication. Walking into the woods with a forager's bucket is still the only way to harvest. Picking is slow. We pop them one by one from their stems, drop them into our containers. We're lucky if each bush yields a palm full of berries. I can't imagine a bear being satisfied by this feast, even if he rakes the whole branch, leaves and all, into his maw. After one hour, we each only have one cup. I can see why they're so expensive, Kate says. We go from bush to bush deeper in, like we're following a reverse breadcrumb trail. When we can't see each other between the pines, we yell our shared name. As we pick, we talk. We fall into silence. I break the heat by shouting, what if bears? We're supposed to sing to keep them away, to keep track of each other. Instead, Kate recites W.H. Auden's Oh, Tell Me the Truth About Love. Some say love's a little boy, the poem starts, and some say it's a bird. Some say it makes the world go round, and some say that's absurd. <laughs> Kate's memorized the extra stanza Auden cut from later versions of this poem. <laughs> I am still afraid of bears, so I ask her to recite it again, loudly. Your feeling when you meet it, I am told you can't forget. I've sought it since I was a child, but haven't found it yet. I'm getting on for 35, and still I do not know what kind of creature it can be that bothers people so. Why would he cut that, she says. It's so good. <laughs> we think it's good because it's confessional, at least compared to the rest of the poem, which gilds its wonder and splints its melancholy with strict rhythm and silly rhymes. Will love look like a pair of pajamas, he asks, or the ham at a temperance hotel? Does its odor remind one of llamas, or has it a comforting smell? In his later years, Auden made significant edits to early poems, including this one. Their sins weren't their youth, I think, though he did advise his lover, Chester Coleman, not to publish before 30. It was the way their youth felt specific, which is to say, not timeless. All genuine poetry is, in a sense, the formation of private spheres out of a public chaos, he wrote. The I in this stanza is more private than public. It's the 35, the not finding, the not knowing. In other words, lack of mastery, maybe we can say vulnerability, narrows the gap between the writer's crafted turmoil and the speaker's stiff upper lip. 
That closeness betrays Auden's cool. It's one of the reasons I love this stanza and the poem. His tossed off, clipped seriousness teeters closer to the private than the public before writing itself again. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me, Auden later wrote, perhaps in agony about Kalman, though the poem takes its stuff from the stars. In those lines, Auden is quite safe, quite earthbound. Oh, tell me the truth about love is just as earthy, but less collected. When it comes, will it come without warning, just as I'm picking my nose? Haunted by its missing stanza, the poem is as public and powerful as a love spell. I once used, oh, tell me the truth about love as a spell. Didn't work. <laughs> Maybe because the man was eating shrimp at the time. Maybe because I didn't look him long enough in the eye, choosing instead to be coy, as if I wasn't reciting from memory a poem about love to a man I thought I could love. What did I think I was doing acting out that Wilco song? I am trying to break your heart. <laughs> I cast a spell to make myself beloved, but instead made a beloved, became the lover, the seeker, not the beloved, not the sought. Trying to enchant, I enchanted myself, like a goddamn girl I was, thinking my love would transform him. That control was love's purpose. Now you have the perfect you to write poems to, a friend told me at the time. Without the lover, the beloved doesn't exist. The night before, I'd gotten drunk alone and danced in my living room with my cat in my arms until my grief rotted into fatigue. I slept well woke late, steadier on my feet. Will it alter my life altogether, Auden asks, because he hopes love will, and he knows enough to be afraid. Raw huckleberries from the west side of the Cascades are surprisingly sour, a little seedy. Not good at all, if I'm being honest. Deep in the labor of picking, we're not attracted by their sugar. We're attracted by their color, how they hide it, a deep purple promising the barest edibility among woods that would starve a child before leading her home. Compared to other forageables, huckleberries are obvious, a beginner's haul, low-hanging fruit, child height, and child size. Tricky to see, but easy to pluck, self-contained, messy with a little pressure or a little heat. Huckleberry juice clings to the fingers like dye, like blood. For days, our hands bear the stains. To lowlanders, huckleberry is a rumor or a word, not something you actually eat. It evokes the West in packaged products, bear-shaped huckleberry honey jars, bear-logoed huckleberry wine. They grow only on the alpine slopes of the Pacific Northwest in Canada, which makes them ours, maybe, in that American way of claiming what appears to be free. Before I went picking, I made the mistake of confusing rarity and myth for easy sweetness. That's not what these berries offer. To require it of them misses the point. Of course, sweetness isn't a sure gift of labor. Think of beehives and bears, of yearning and possession. How bears endure the sting to get at the sweet, viciously tearing through viciousness. The labor of picking will be rewarded with sweetness later when I stir a cup of sugar into the berries and let them sit overnight, macerating before concealing them in a pie. Sugar will force its way into the fruit, replacing water with itself. The oven will smooth seediness into jam. The pie will shock us with its purple, its fragrance. It will be rich despite the simplicity of its materials. This is as close to domesticating the huckleberry as Kate and I will ever get. What we taste won't be the wildness. In each bite, each splash of juice mopped from the plate will taste the seeking. Thank you.
your attention one more time. Whoa, hello. We're going to start again right now. Our 10 minute intermission just went to 20 minutes, just like that. And I think people are talking to strangers, so that's really good. I don't really want to stop you, but we have a couple more things we're going to do. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So the next things we're going to do is we're going to have Jesse Ray Howard come up in, in a minute and read a poem for the Favorite Poem Project. I'm going to explain what the heck that is. And then we're also going to have Kate Lebo and Molly Weisenberg come back up and we're going to do a Q&A. So I'll be asking some questions and if you in the audience want to raise your hands, I'm happy to have you guys participate as well. And then I think there's more sweets and desserts back there and more books to be signed. And we all have to get out of here a little before 9 or we get kicked out. So I don't think we'll get that far. Words West is building on the idea of a national favorite poem project, which is dedicated to celebrating, documenting, and encouraging poetry's role in Americans' lives. Robert Pinsky former poet laureate of the United States, founded the Favorite Poem Project in 1997. They have a great website. And people of every age, every background, are contributing. You can go on that site, and you can find people from all over the United States, age 6 to about 106, saying a poem that's meant something to them in their lives and why that was important. And I'll just share that I was part of one of those projects in Boston about four years ago, and I'd never been part of such a moving poetry reading as having just ordinary people say, I've had this poem in my pocket. I work in a restaurant, and once when I was really having a meltdown in the deep freeze, the chef gave me this poem. So we felt it really important to involve area businesses, and we thought that it was a really nice way to show that poetry is really for everyone. That's the point. Pinsky believes that poetry is a vocal art, an art meant to be read aloud. If a poem is written well, he says, it was written with a poet's voice, and it was written for a voice. Reading a poem silently instead of saying a poem is like the difference between staring at sheet music or actually humming and playing the music on an instrument or with a voice. It so happens when we started this program in September, Robert Pinsky was in town that week to do the favorite, pro favorite Poem Project. That's harder to say than you would think <laughs> at Town Hall. And so it felt like a really auspicious beginning for us. Tonight's favorite poem will be read by Jesse Ray Howard, who lives in the Delridge area of West Seattle. Jesse is a founding board member of Delridge Grocery Co-op. Delridge is a West Seattle neighborhood, which you probably already know that's considered, maybe you didn't know this, a food desert, meaning there are no easily accessible fresh produce or nutritious grocery supplies for the community. Delridge Grocery Co-op will soon provide its community with a local, sustainable food source within walking distance from their homes. Please help me welcome Jesse Ray Howie. happy to be here. I'm happy to be a participant and a witness. Thank you, lovely, beautiful word women, wordsmiths. Um, if I knew you were so gorgeous, I would have combed my hair before I came. Down, on this. Um, down in the Delridge neighborhood, there's a um, group of people, and we're working on bringing the community co-op, so a neighborhood-owned grocery store, to the area. Is anyone here a member of the Delridge co-op? Yay! Woo. Um, we are in a pretty crucial time right now where we just need a few more members so that we can meet a milestone and get the show on the road. So after the reading, um, after the event tonight, I'll be here and Renette Eiding, who's like the queen of the co-op over there, um, mm -hmm. will, can answer questions and whatever. Okay. Um, Favorite poem, it was really difficult to choose that. Um, I'm gonna read a poem by Pablo Neruda. And the first time I read this poem was when I was a very young woman living in Spain. And the first time I read it in Spain, I did not understand a single word. <clears throat> um, 
and there was no, it was just a book in Spanish, and so there was no translation. And um, by the time I left my journey there, which was about a year in, I read the poem again, and I not only understood every word, but I recognized how language represents freedom for me and um, liberation. And Susan said, talk to strangers. And when we understand the language of the community, we can talk to strangers and life um, becomes much more expansive. And that's what happened to me as a young American girl from a small farming community in Washington who lived in Spain for that time and um, just realized how language just blew my mind open. So Pablo Neruda, um, I was just sharing with Renette that I pulled this book off the shelf and in 1997 I gave this to my husband and I had a little note in the front and um, Pablo Neruda was very influential in my life and I have to say that I used to read whisper these love poems in my husband's ear before we were married and that's why he asked me to marry him I'm sure so thank you <laughs> thank you Pablo Neruda um, I, sh I chose a short poem because I'm much more comfortable listening than speaking and because it's one of my favorites um, I'm gonna uh, read it to you in Spanish and then I'll read the translation and um, any native Spanish speakers in the room? Yes. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. No. Um, since there aren't, you have the wonderful opportunity of listening to, well, any Spanish speaking? Not native, but Spanish speaking. Okay. The listening to words that um, sound unfamiliar, but still the emotion and the meaning of the poem come through. And then you can check your work later when I read it in English. <clears throat> la poesía. Y fue a esa edad, llegó la poesía a buscarme. No sé, no sé de dónde salió, de invierno o río. No sé cómo ni cuándo. No, no eran voces, no eran palabras ni silencio. Pero desde una calle me llamaba, desde las ramas de la noche, de pronto entre los otros, entre fuegos violentos, o regresando solo, allí estaba sin rostro y me tocaba. Yo no sabía qué decir, mi boca no sabía, nombrar, mis ojos eran ciegos, y algo golpeaba en mi alma, fiebre o alas perdidas y me fue haciendo solo, desenfrando. Aquella que madura y escribe la primera línea vega, vega, sin cuerpo, pura, tontería, pura sabiduría del que no sabe nada. Y vi de pronto el cielo desgranado y abierto, planetas, Plantaciones palpitantes, la sombra perforada, acribillada, por flechas, fuegos y flores, la noche arrolladora el universo, y yo, mínimo ser, ebrio del gran vacío, constelado, a semejanza a imagen del miestro. Me sentí para pura del abismo. Rodé con las estrellas. Mi corazón se desató en el viento. Thank you. It's called poetry. And it was at that age poetry arrived in search of me. I do not know I do not know where it came from, from winter or a river. I do not know how or when. No, they were not voices. They were not words nor silence. But from a street I was summoned from the branches of night abruptly from the others among violent fires. Or returning alone, there I was without a face, and it touched me. 
I did not know what to say. My mouth had no way with names. My eyes were blind. And something started in my soul, fever or forgotten wings. And I made my own way, deciphering that fire. And I wrote the first faint line, faint without substance, pure nonsense, pure wisdom of someone who knows nothing. And suddenly I saw the heavens unfastened and opened planets, palpitating plantations, shadow perforated, riddled with errors, arrows, fire and flowers, the winding night, the universe, and I, infinitesimal being, drunk with the great starry void, likeness, image of mystery, felt myself a pure part of the abyss. I wheeled with the stars, and my heart broke loose on the wind. Thank you. because we know you're going to be real busy and we're going to take a break. But we'll be back the third week of January with Francis McHugh, the poet and memoir writer, and Erica Bauermeister, who I'm probably mangling her name. Bauermeister. Thank you, Bauermeister, um, who is a writer on food as well. So we really hope that you won't forget us and you'll be back to help us in with um, destroyed or debated New Year's resolutions, because by the third week in January, you know what happens to those resolutions. That's gonna be their theme. But right now, we have Molly and Kate, and my first question is, and I should say the questions came from all three of the curators, and then often what happens is people in the audience decide they have something that they wanna to ask too, so we'll do both. What connections do you experience between creativity in the kitchen and creativity on the page? If any. If any. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I started writing all of these books, The Commonplace Book of Pi and Pi School, um, and the essays and the poems in the middle of uh, bouts of cooking and bouts of trying to write for a blog. So for me, um, often what happens with, with cooking is it's a, um, a respite from the unsure labor that's happening at my computer. Um, something I've said a lot and that I still mean is that I always know when the pie is good. <laughs> and I d don't ever have that same certainty with my other creative work. And so some of it is uh, that, you know, just, just sating my, my ego, my poor, poor ego. Um, but some of it is also um, t uh, uh, taking a break from that sitting position um, and going and working with different types of materials for a while. Yeah. yeah, the first thing I thought of was sort of echoing what you were saying is that I think that uh, for all of us who write, <clears throat> there's so much time spent in our heads that the, for me the tangible work of, of cooking is a tremendous relief. And I think in times when I have, I mean, I, I, in retrospect, it doesn't surprise me that 
food was um, that, that when I decided to start, well, I decided to start a blog because I wanted, um, I wanted to write more and I needed something to hold me accountable to, to doing that. And having this, this public thing that was a blog forced me to keep showing up and keep practicing. And in retrospect, it doesn't surprise me that the sort of unifying topic would have been food because um, whenever I am stuck with a piece of writing, um, well, there's sort of one or two, one of two different things that I will do. Either I will try to um, use a recipe to kind of jumpstart me into writing. I mean, as Kate actually, and I have talked about, a recipe is a, another way of telling a story. It is just a, a certain kind of structure for a story. So um, very often when I'm blogging, if I am feeling really stuck, I'll just start from the recipe and start basically um, taking apart the recipe and trying to use parts of it as a springboard, as a way to sort of focus me um, and kind of shut off that that part of my brain that's like, what am, what am I going to say? And is it going to be good? And mm -hmm. yeah, so food is a, is a wonderful tool for focusing me um, and quieting all those little voices to just get me started. You're both reminding me, when I was in graduate school, I lived in a co-op house and I was doing education development. When I couldn't write papers, I would make these big giant dinners for everyone. And my roommates were like, yeah, the writing's not going so well. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Ted Hughes always said about Sylvia, Sylvia Plath, is that when he had a buffet laid before him, he knew that she'd had a bad day <laughs> writing. Yeah. So, what's the most daring thing you've made in the kitchen or an equally daring writing exploit? Uh, I'll start with the writing. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was writing my first book, I wrote it entirely out of order. I didn't, I didn't really know how to write a book, and I, w I wasn't sure that I could even do it. And I wrote it out of order, again, sort of using these recipes as like springboards and then stepping back to figure out what actually the story was that I had started telling. But at a certain point in that process, I, I was falling asleep one night, and I'm sure you've all had this feeling like you're, you're no longer really fully conscious, but all of a sudden you get this great idea. It's like, the, you know, the, the having your good ideas while you're in the shower phenomenon. Anyway, I was starting to fall asleep and I suddenly realized that the missing link between some stories that I had written was that I needed to write about my father's actual death. My first book is a lot about losing my father when I was in my early 20s. And I had felt like people expect this book to be about food, they expect me to write about food, and they don't want to hear about what it was like to actually watch somebody die. And yet it felt very clear to me um, that I had to write that down even if I didn't use it. And, and it's, the, it's the part of the book that I'm most proud of because I feel like I really, I showed up and, and got some stuff on paper that had been in my head that was really scary and I gave it another place to live outside of myself and I'm really, I'm really proud of that and it was also terrifying the whole time. I'm thinking about the um, kind of book proposal that I'm working on right now. It feels actually whenever I show it to someone, I kind of feel like I want to puke a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that, what I'm, how I'm supposed to read that feeling exactly. If it means that it's not ready, if it means that it's just so daring or what have you. But what's going on is that I'm trying to figure out how to um, weave a bunch of stuff about God and sex and my parents and food and really of difficult course. food <laughs> all together, right? All together into one, into this, into this thing that's supposed to work. And I think like the fear um, for me in some ways is trying to <coughs> figure out exactly how close to the bone you, you can get within a food memoir um, and have it work. Because in some cases what I'm writing about is gross real gross, right? It's not appetizing. <laughs> what kind of food, can I ask? Is I'm, there? this first chapter that I've been working on that's kind of, that I'm just sitting on is quince, which for me is, um, 
was this <laughs> lovely, horrendous experience of, of, of smelling a really beautiful and seeing a really beautiful fruit and then taking the first bite and feeling like my whole mouth is getting chewed out, which of course became this great, once I um, learned that quince is a metaphor for love, or not a metaphor, excuse me, a symbol uh, for love in a lot of different cultures, um, and that quince very might well have been the apple that Eve and Adam ate because apple um, shares, the Latin for apple shares uh, the same spelling as the word for evil also. Um, and they often used um, the word apple to refer to all different kinds of fruits. And quince is older than apples. Anyway. And you have a quince in the back and of the room. Should anyone back. want to smell it or yeah. bite it? Yeah, well, it's in your purse now. Yes, I, I stole it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, just, it's just, you know, like this, this fruit of knowledge um, and this fruit that defies our expectation that we should be able to pick something out of a grocery bin and just stuff it directly into our faces, which I love. I really want to find some food that is not there for you mm -hmm. to consume it. You know? I don't think about that. Yeah, so... So I have plenty of questions, but I'm really more interested in what you're thinking about right now than what I'm thinking about. So does anybody want to ask anything? We're not strangers anymore. <laughs> I'll go on with one more. Oh, I see one in the back. Just kind of going off of your, the, the second part of your question, what is the a dish that you're most proud of? I was so damn proud to be able to feed myself beans in grad school. Oh my god, that was exact. I was gonna say beans. Really? A pot of beans. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just today actually failed at a, a pot of beans yeah. after like a like a, like years of great success. Yeah. Totally failed with it a pot be of beans hard. today. Yeah. No, I think beans. Simplest, That's hardest. hardest thing ever. Cooking a really good pot of beans. Ooh. I had some serious Swishy crunchy beans. beans today that I finally scorched to the pan because I forgot about them. <laughs> <laughs> and they were still crunchy. All right, so keep trying. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> morning, you get them, right? Right. Are there other food writers that inspire you? Are there writers that you go to or that you read when you were? I got really obsessed with just the joy of cooking. In a reading, um, one of the, the old old versions of it that you know where it teaches you how to skin a raccoon. Um, <laughs> of course, right? But I get and, and or I've got a copy of the White House Cookbook that is falling apart and so is worth nothing, but it's this really cool record of um, supposedly how the president ate um, in the late 1800s. Wow! And you can find things like quince stock, which we were talking about earlier, which is a, a way of um, pr or, or thickening your jam. Um, at the turn of the 19th wow. century, sort of thing. I think that stuff's neat. I guess, what the, and what's neat about it is kind of um, when you read these historical cookbooks, if you ever get a note like, don't do what everyone else does, um, do this instead. If you want to figure out really how people cooked, you do exactly what the recipe tells you not to do, sort of thing. So it's this mm -hmm. like, critical reading. It's kind of fun. Very cool. Yeah. Oh. Um, I really. Um, I really love writing that is very funny. Um, so I find that some of my favorite food writers are um, very irreverent. And I really like it. Um, you know, the truth is I'm not that interested in talking about food. Like I'm just, I'm not, um, it took me a while to figure out that, um, yeah, I am not that interested in talking about food and I'm not that interested in understanding everything about food, but I'm really interested in the way that food is sort of a marker of our days. And I'm really interested in, in like the, the function food serves among people. So I'm really interested in people. And, and the writers that I like best are writers who clearly love people and are fascinated by people and the way people live, and the writers who are funny. So um, I love Calvin Trillin so much. Both his writing about, about you know, life in America and his food writing, his writing about his wife. Um, and I love Francis Lamb, who is, uh, you know, sort of more of, of my generation. He was a contributing editor to Gourmet uh, before it passed away. 
And uh, he's actually now a cookbook editor at Clarkson Potter, but he occasionally publishes things here and there. And it's just so smart and funny, and um, it's about so much more than food. I'm going to open up to the audience one more time before I close it with one question. Ah, yes. Well, I was wondering when, when you're invited to somebody's house for their cooking, do you find that they are a little, I mean, do they apologize? How do they react? <laughs> Could you guys hear that question? No. 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 So the question essentially was, when these two lovely women get invited to other people's houses for a meal, do the hosts sort of apologize for not being kind of up to snuff, I guess, on their pies or on their meal? Is that fair? Yeah. Good question. No. And I'm so <laughs> glad. And I have to say that I have cooked some of my worst meals for company. I mean, I have horribly embarrassed myself. Um, when we were first becoming friends with, um, with a woman who, who was sort of a mentor to us in the restaurant industry, um, I made a carrot soup for lunch for us one day and like dramatically undercooked the carrots. So when I went to puree it, it was like, like vomit <laughs> texture. It was so bad. It was really, really bad. I, I, I have a dear friend who, um, she is a, a full-time mom and an incredible cook and cooks like three separate things each night as part of her meal, I mean, unheard of. But anyway, I have had her over to dinner twice that I can remember and both times I've made horrible food. <laughs> so um, I think that I've set the bar really low. And um, Anyone can cook. Yeah, I think I, I tend to, you know, I get nervous, just like anybody does with company, and I mess stuff up. Or I think I know more than I do, and I don't. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy when people invite me over for dinner, because I've been a gypsy <laughs> for a year and a half. I don't have a kitchen, and I haven't been cooking. Um, and I haven't noticed anyone get too, too <laughs> weirded out by me being there. But I have noticed that I have a really bad habit that I'm working on right now, which is, uh, if I, when it comes to pie, if I didn't think of it, I'm a little suspicious. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing that as a reaction. Like, that's not cool. <laughs> so I'm trying to respond the opposite way by being extremely excited every time I feel suspicious and then trying the pie. Is it working out okay? Yeah, no, it's great. You gotta stay open, right? So I guess I've also seen um, people that I admire, mentors um, even, um, who become <coughs> the kind of experts who can be the only experts in the room. You know, it's exciting to be an expert. It's, it feels purely accidental and strange, and just like a, a um, mantle that's been given me um, by the people who taste your pie. Str strange. Well, <laughs> but I think the thing that um, I've always felt is that one of the reasons I'm good at pie is because I make it all the time. Not that it's. I mean, it is good. But the one of the reasons I became known as a pie lady is just simply from by making it more than everyone else. That that's how I became an expert <laughs> by doing it more than everyone else, and that was it. Really, I don't know. You know. So anyway, I want to try trying to be a better expert in my life. <laughs> Should we all aspire for such things? Um, last question: What is a project that you're working on, or dreaming about, or thinking about that you could share a little with us? No, you go. No, I, I'm going to think about it. I don't have a project right now. Go ahead. Okay, so I have been working on, after I graduated from um, UW's MFA program, like, I, my brain was jello, as you can imagine. After any, anyone who's a graduate has that issue. Um, so I turned to writing. I still had that need to write something every day, otherwise I felt like crap, you know? Like you got to write. And it buoys the poor ego that we talked about earlier. Um, <laughs> So what I did was turn to text that was already available to me on Wiki and, and, and legally, you know, mine and everyone's Wikipedia, and erased um, entries for fruits, herbs, and vegetables just for fun, just kind of playing around. Um, and now it's about forty pages long. Oh wow! And I'm going to turn it into. A, I'm working with Dan Schaefer, who's a fantastic 
um, book artist and book designer, and we're going to make an, a zine, basically, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and that's going to be in um, Sharon Arnold's Length by Width by Height art subscription box, which will be out in January. Yeah. Very so cool. So you heard it here first. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Did we give you enough time? Um, yeah, I still don't have a satisfying answer. I'm really happy to not be working on anything right now. Um, yeah, my uh, my husband and I opened our first restaurant uh, three months after my first book came out, and then um, opened a second business three weeks before I had a baby, and I and I had a book that came out this past spring so I'm like really excited <laughs> to just uh, hey, I started doing like yoga every morning at home so like um, that's my project right now is sort of just um, living for a little bit to have some more stories <laughs> trying trying not to um, trying to embrace the fact that my daughter is two and is um, <coughs> an outspoken Opinionated woman. <laughs> That's my project. So stay tuned. That'll keep you busy. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to say a couple of things before we do all the clapping that you're about to do. I can feel it in the room. Um, and that is to remind you that there are books for sale and that the holiday season is upon us. So should you know anyone who enjoys pie or stories of restaurants or lots of just fantastic writing, um, you can get the book signed, which is kind of an extra sweetness. And Kate had asked me to mention that her piece that she read today is in the High Plains Journal. High Desert Journal. High Desert Journal. And the pie that came out of that experience um, is on their website, should you want to make it. Fantastic. So thank you so much. Please hang around, talk to someone you don't know or that you didn't know when you came in. And um, we'll be around for a bit and then we'll see you again in January. Take care and have great holidays. Yay.